Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Uh, it's an honor for us to uh, be here tonight. It's also an honor for us that uh, you would pick us to uh, advise you as to uh, what we think about uh, many of the items that uh, were presented to us. Uh, first, let me say that uh, I, uh, uh, the city staff did a great job for us, led by uh, Mary Lynn Strata. And uh, she and Janice Hampton, they had their people there at our disposal whenever we needed any kind of uh, information. So appreciate their their help. And uh, Mary Lynn especially coordinated uh, the whole thing. Um, Janice uh, picked uh, Alan Borquez as a legal counsel for the committee. And I, you have before you his resume, and I think you can tell from his publications and his honors uh, what uh, his credentials are. And we were pleased uh, to be able to utilize uh, his services. Uh, how I was picked as chairman, I don't know, but uh, I was not pleased about that. <laughs> but I was pleased with the people that... Uh, were picked to serve with me, and if I may introduce them at this time, uh, right here by the aisle is uh, Richard Cortez. Richard, if you'd stand. Richard is a 30-year uh, employee, re now retired, of the U.S. Postal Service, and a, also a proud member of the class, Stephen F. Austin High School class of 1968, with me. And uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> George Nelson. George, would you stand? George is a longtime banker in the community uh, with a competitor bank to the business that I work for, and he was a fierce competitor. I'm so glad he's retired now. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, George, uh, thank you for serving on the committee. Um, Kenny Lawson. Kenny uh, is a, uh, a large business owner in the community, employs a lot of people. And it's been a pleasure for me to uh, serve with you, Kenny. Thank, Thank you. Um, Je uh, uh, Janita Rayford, I don't think is here. Uh, Janita is with the federal prison system. I met her for the first time on day one of our committee meetings, and I enjoyed uh, getting to know her, and she was a valuable member of the committee. Also, Gabriel Garcia, who is a, uh, a business owner here in the community, he's not here tonight. But uh, he was an integral part of our discussions before, during, and after the committee discussions. And, and finally, Eugene Sonny Lyles, who uh, I met 25 or 6 years ago when I moved back home at the Little League Park. And uh, we have daughters that are the same age, and he's also been with a competitor, Banks. And uh, really, uh, I'm going to let him present... Uh, our findings to you because he he played such a huge role in the crafting along with Mr. Barquez, the crafting of uh, of our uh, of our decisions and uh, he's much more articulate than than I am. And uh, anyway, it's, it's been my personal pleasure to to serve with them. Let me say that uh, when uh, Mrs. Estrada called me to kind of talk about setting this thing up, I asked her to not let the staff lead us in a certain direction. I wanted us to consider every item on its own merits and, uh, and, and our life experiences and, and what we see and feel. And she assured me she would do that. And uh, I can honestly say that the city staff only gave us background information and did not uh, try to uh, lead us or influence in any, any direction. I polled each of the committee members and asked them had they been contacted by any uh, citizens or uh, uh, council members lobbied in any way uh, prior to their service on the committee, and they assured me that they, they had not been, as, as I had not been. Uh, I also uh, asked uh, Mr. Mr. Barquez, our legal counsel, if he had been... Uh, talked to or, or uh, 
or, uh, uh, lobbied or sold on, uh, on trying to lead us in any direction. He said he had not. He assured us that he had not. So I'm satisfied that uh, we showed up for those committee meetings. In my case, I had only heard about a couple of the, of the charter amendments. And, uh, and uh, so I felt comfortable that we were all coming into this with a clear mind and a, a open uh, mind uh, relative to what we would recommend to the, uh, the city council. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I talked to two people my brother and one other, because uh, both of them have strong opinions about some things, and uh, they uh, they agreed with the direction that the committee ultimately went. And uh, although they felt like that uh, there were some things in the charter amendments that were worthy, they had they felt a different way. Uh, uh, about where they should be uh, discussed and implemented, if implemented at all. Uh, the only dissension we had was, as I asked the committee to rename the Travis Bryan Municipal Golf Course, the Timothy Norman Bryan Municipal Golf Course, and there had no seconds, Mayor. <laughs> so uh, tongue in cheek on that, please, press. Uh, but let me turn this over to, uh, to Sonny Lyles, and he'll go through this point by point with you and and uh, I think give you a good feel for our discussions and how we came to the conclusions that we did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure appreciate your time and leadership and like to ask uh, Sonny Lyles to step forward and tell us what you did. Well, we worked. Uh, it was a pleasure working with this group, uh, Mayor and, and uh, Mr. Ca and the council persons here. Uh, I, I would reiterate everything that uh, Tim said uh, to include the fact that going into this as uh, part of a new body politic that we had never been part of before, uh, but knowing that every one of the precincts were represented gave us a lot of comfort. One of the things that made it easy for us to, by discussion, caucus, and open discussion, and all these meetings were uh, done by uh, pursuant to Open Records Act, they were open to the public. What you have before you is a lot of information. Uh, it's got uh, the minutes of all the meetings, so if you wanted to go through all the minutes of what the discussions were, you can see that. It has an annotated version of the charter uh, with the suggested amendments that we have, uh, and it also has our conclusions in regard to those things that we think should be supported by the council via amendment to the charter and those things that we think should not be supported by the council via amendment to the charter and then the reasons why. Uh, a great luxury we had going into this was we did have a municipal law expert with us who was indeed a neutral. Mr. Alan Boraquez, who is here with us tonight, was an enormous resource for us. Uh, not only just a resource legally, but he would allow us and allow our discussions to go wherever they needed to go in order for us to meet the task that was assigned to us uh, via these appointments and via the mayor. We would ask him whether it was legal, illegal, invalid, inappropriate, best practice, or whatever. And what he kept telling us was, uh, if you ask me those questions, I can tell you. Uh, but the, the main thing was a little bit of education, and not that anyone needs any more education, but a little bit of education of where we were, where we started, and then how we arrived at our decisions, I think would be helpful for you all if you, if you wouldn't mind. Basically, our discussions were open dialogue, open caucus, but with some instructions. We need to review the charter for what a charter is. Uh, you can do it every two years, as y'all know, but a charter is much like the Constitution of the United States, the state constitution, uh, articles of incorporation for a not-for-profit. Uh, it's basically how it sets forth uh, offices, duties, responsibilities, and limitations. That's basically what a charter has done since, I don't know, at least 1913 or whatever started here. Our charge, though, was to work completely independently, uh, but to for us to be uh, open for uh, considering what the staff thought 
changes to the charter should be considered. We actually came up with a little bit on our own that hopefully Mr. Roquez uh, said, that sounds pretty good to me too. Uh, and then we reviewed all the things that are being proposed by petition. So Tim had told you a little bit about the uh, background, but I'd like to tell what we were to do and what this is supposed to do tonight. Uh, we've made presentations to the Planning and Zoning and the Bryan Business Council and tonight to uh, the uh, City Council as we've been requested. Uh, basically tonight, uh, this is a, an oral summary, verbal summary, and a little bit of insight on how we came up with our conclusions. Uh, what you have before you is the total package of, of everything that we did uh, in for the uh, Charter Review Advisory Committee. I can just tell you briefly what the conclusions are. There were 13 issues where uh, we considered uh, what we were supposed to do. And that is we needed to consider things from the standpoint that they shouldn't be a burden to the council. The council should be able to conduct its business. There should be brevity. There should be clarity. And the charter is there for the best interests of the citizens of Bryan and for the operations of the citizens of Bryan. So with that being said, we then had to make determinations of the suggestions for the uh, considerations for amendment that would be proposed or, or supported by the council. Uh, and in each case, we voted on it. Uh, there was a unanimous vote, zero dissent on a committee that represented the entire city. For those things that we didn't support, don't support, it had to do with whether they were appropriate for a charter, whether or not they were valid or illegal or vague or not supported by law or best practices of a city or would in some way encumber or put the city of Bryan at a competitive disadvantage. We thought through all those things. And as Tim said, some of the ideas that are proposed by amendment or for good for discussion, and there are things that we need to strive for. But in every case, we determined that when they're not proper for the charter, we would not support them or could not support them. So if I could, I'd like to go through the 13 items that, that quickly, the 13 items that we thought that the city council should consider in support of changes to uh, the uh, city charter. I'd like to do the easy ones first only because it just shows you that we looked at the small and the large. Uh, from an easy standpoint, uh, if we would go to, there's a, an amendment we were suggesting at section 16 under powers of the city to own. Since we're not sure, it could be 1913 plus, the city enumerates its ability to own things, such as water, sewer systems, maintain and extend construction for water, and it used to say light and sewer systems within and outside the city. It was determined we probably don't own the light. So we changed that suggested change for you to consider is to move the word light to electric. We think that's probably a little more accurate. Uh, the other thing was an easy change. We've been referring to a chief financial officer for several years here within the city. At section 12, chief financial officer is what we're suggesting. Right now it says chief finance officer. Uh, another easy one has to do with the establishment of corporate powers at section 1. And the powers of the city are to regulate construction, height, maintenance, occupancy, and the material used in all buildings. There's been a question lately whether or not buildings is inclusive enough. So we're suggesting to add the word and structures, which I think should be fairly easy to do. Uh, one of the other things, uh, Mayor, have to do with your powers. Uh, it was uh, provided to us by Mr. Alan Boraquez that the mayor has the powers enumerated by charter. But it includes the power of a, like a justice of the peace to administer oaths. And the other power that you have is to punish by contempt for people being rowdy here at the city council meetings. Well, that never happens. What I have to say to you is you do not have those powers by law or otherwise. So our suggestion is, which pretty much follows uh, what the committee wanted to do. Uh, these are not supported by state law. And since they're not supported by state law, 
uh, the committee would suggest that they be stricken from the charter. No jail time from the mayor, huh? No. All right. All, All right. right. All right. Um, question about this item? Yeah, about that. Um, do, do, you, do you mind if we uh, ask a question, or would you like to, to If you could hold them to the end, okay. it would okay. be, I think it would be helpful if you, we could just bet. go through it. Well, we thank you for your time. If that works. We'll, we'll respect that. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, then going to the more serious things that we were considered, uh, the first one had to do with Section 5 of the City Council, and it had to do with what duties of the City Council are. And what we suggested is, because uh, our committee notes are, still consistent. A charter should be flexible for how city council meetings are conducted and thus leave the format of the city council meeting agendas to the discretion of the city council as each new council is convened. Uh, we supported a city council's practice of establishing meeting procedures by ordinance and find the current rules are adequate to ensure the public's business is conducted efficiently. That being said, our suggestion is in regard to how things get on the agenda is that any two council members desiring a particular item simply notify the city secretary in writing and the item is placed on the agenda subject to the order of agendas as already set forth by resolution or ordinance. And then it says the city council shall by ordinance follow annual city council general election established rules and procedures for conducting city council meetings, including timing, location, and format, and those be governed until repeals. And if it's not governed by an ordinance or resolution, then you would default to the charter. And that is supported by uh, our special counsel that that would be appropriate for home rule cities. The next item has to do with council member independence. Council member independence we think is very important. However, the section at, at R in regard to council member independence was by our notes inconsistent with the Texas government code as it applied to municipalities and unduly restricted the city's ability to engage our community volunteers. So what we simply did was edit, the suggested edit for council member independence is to change the degrees of consanguinity and affinity simply to meet up with what state law is in regard to this and make it as clear and not vague. And hopefully that's what that suggested edit does. And then it's consistent with the Texas government code. Again, a flavor that, the, 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 that our committee had is to make it consistent with state law, local government code, or the government code. The next note under council member independence, which we think is important, simply had to do with a vague term in the charter. Presently in the charter, it says that in regard to elections or local elections at R2, that the use of prestige of a city official's position should not be done in regard to a, a local election. Uh, we felt like that was vague when that was presented to us, and we think that the proper term there should be the word title, and that you wouldn't be able to use your title in support of uh, local elections or a candidate for local elections. You certainly can, but we thought the word prestige was just too vague. Title seemed more accurate and, uh, again, was supported by the committee and, and our research. Uh, the next item has to do with campaign donations for elected city officials and candidates. We looked at the language, and, and this is where our special counsel was most helpful. Uh, we felt like the language was vague, inappropriate, and by counsel, probably violated First Amendment rights which of course we don't want to do with our charter. However, we didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel because we felt like ethics is important and we felt like the state of Texas somewhere in the government code or local government code uh, uh, had in fact set forth what the regulations and requirements ought to be for that. And in fact, uh, Texas has passed the Fair Campaign Practices Act uh, through the Texas Election Code. So our simple fix was that campaign donations regarding any city official and candidates shall comply with the Fair Campaign Practices Act and the Texas Election Code. It cleans it up, it makes it accurate as to state law, and we think that's the direction that should go for an edit for the charter. 
The next item had to do with ordinances. And I know this is a, a topic that uh, we all considered and talked about for a long time. Uh, and you, it's reflected in the notes. We know that the, more or less, either by uh, practice, it has been that ordinances would be read twice. I think everybody that's been involved with municipal law just knows that happens. Uh, one of our uh, tasks, of course, was going through the charter and see if any, any amendments made sense would, would more accurately reflect what the law is. And what we what we found was is that state law does not require ordinances to be read more than once. State law does require reading of ordinances for certain specifics, like uh, an increase in taxes, which is certainly important and would take two two readings. Also, if we have to read it more than once. Uh, as a consensus of the committee, uh, it's restrictive uh, for city councils. If you're trying to be flexible and responsible to a specific act that's not technically uh, emergency status, then you're still going to be hampered by the, the, the two readings. So since state law does not require that it be read more than once for certain type of actions, then our suggestion is that for ordinances that the readings only happen once. Uh, that's our suggestion. If, the sec if that suggestion is something that the city council can support, what it does is it makes us more uh, in line with state law. Uh, for a home rule city, it's not necessarily appropriate for a home rule city to make that requirement. Uh, and it certainly gives you an ability, uh, a, a flexible ability, to uh, respond in, in, in almost in any manner that you need to and as fast as you need to. When it comes to the uh, 13 things that we talked about, uh, and one of the specifics was... Uh, We wanted to be able to go through all the things suggested either by staff or by ourselves, which you have there, and then open discussions, open caucus. Uh, then uh, Chairman uh, Brian would then suggest, uh, do we have a motion in a second, which we would, then we'd vote on it. And on all 13 suggestions for edits to the charter that we are proposing that the city council would support, uh, if they choose to do so, uh, our votes were unanimous with no dissent. And uh, so we felt pretty good about that because that's representative of all the members of the committee, which represented the entire city. And I think to that task, we stuck to it. Then we set that aside. And uh, with the uh, direction from uh, uh, Mr. Bryan, then we then set aside uh, everything that we had done previously to focus on those things being uh, presented, proposed to be amended by petition and vote of, of um, and vote of the populace, uh, and the reason for that was uh, we wanted to do it again, again in an open manner, uh, w with everyone being neutral, and in some cases trying to look a little bit deeper behind what the meanings of some of these proposals were, uh, whether they were justified or whether they really needed to be addressed. Uh, one thing you, that we needed to know, though, is uh, there can be, though, legal impediments, whether they're unnecessary, inappropriate, illegal, unlawful, impractical, or vague, that prevent amendments to a charter, even if passed, from being enforced. Uh, that's called void ad minitio. Uh, and what that means is they're void at their inception. Uh, and, and as a footnote, I'd like to address that last, if I could, uh, because that was something that came up with our committee uh, that uh, uh, we thought that there was possibly a way we could solve all the issues, uh, but uh, we stuck to our task. And then once that was over, those, those, that particular issue came up. Uh, but the reality is, and uh, even if the process... Uh, were ever to present a uh, petition item for amendment that uh, was on its face illegal, 
according to state law and case law, uh, that's usually addressed after the vote, not before the vote, although it can be addressed before the vote. But we'll get to that. So as a committee, uh, we were asked specifically to go through each one of these and determine whether or not we could, uh, after discussion, uh, support those uh, and offer those in support to the city council to support. For all of the 10 propositions, the consensus vote was unanimous in opposition to all the items being presented for amendment uh, by petition. The first one we'll go through has to do with section 24 regarding establishing zoning, or zoning ordinances to preclude housing of more than two unrelated adults. Now, what clearly uh, the committee, along with Mr. Borroquez's uh, ability to uh, provide us uh, neutral legal counsel, is that zoning is a legislative act reserved by state law for the city council, which means you can't delegate that particular item to someone that doesn't have legislative authority, in this case, voters. Presently, uh, through our uh, interaction with city staff and PNZ, there is a means of addressing these issues through the current process established for planning and zoning. Not to mention the fact that the Texas legislature right now is scheduled in special session to consider rules that would preempt municipalities from regulating short-term rentals. So based on those items, again, uh, considering whether or not they're unnecessary, inappropriate, uh, illegal, or impractical, uh, the committee, uh, by unanimous uh, vote, decided that we could not support uh, number one. Number two has to do with section 24. Their proposal is city council shall conduct a survey of property owners within 500 feet of any property be re rezoned or applying for a conditional use permit. 55% or more of the property owners within 500 feet of the property must agree. Again, the committee's notes show that this is inappropriate for inclusion in a city charter for a home rule city. Again, it's a legislative act reserved by state law for the city council to allow the voters to dictate what would happen in re this regard is an unlawful delegation of the legislative authority, again, sufficiently addressed by planning and zoning. The next three items that, to, to discuss pretty much have the same uh, uh, legal conclusions, and again, by unanimous vote, our committee decided that we couldn't support these. And one of the reasons is we've already said that you can, the uh, charter already advises the council on how they can set their meetings and that uh, they should be able to do it every time they convene every two years and make it appropriate for all the council members. And of course, they have to consider the citizens in the city and everything else. So that theory, uh, permeated the next three sections. Uh, the proposed section five change has to do with conducting hearing for citizens at a specific time. Section five has to do with conducting regular meetings on second and fourth Tuesdays only. Section five has to do with the city council conducting open sessions of the regular council meetings no earlier than six o'clock. And, and in almost every case, none of these are a best practice for a home rule city. Uh, but in conclusion, all three of these would be inappropriate for inclusion in a home rule charter. It's uncommon for home rule charters. Uh, and we confirm that the level of detail about conducting city council meetings is unnecessary and common for inclusion in a charter. Uh, it's more appropriate for ordinance or resolution, and that's in every case. Uh, one of the specifics about four had to do with uh, holidays, which were undefined, and undefined holidays are vague and, and unenforceable. Section five regarding when meetings could be conducted. Uh, again, it was confirmed by special counsel. This is a level of detail about conducting city council meetings. It's unnecessary and uncommon and inappropriate for inclusion in a home rule charter. Then we move to number six, and as... Uh, Tim said his suggestion was voted down. 
But uh, it was it was, I thought, helpful for us. I know that's been a contentious point for a lot of people uh, in town and to have uh, Tim on the committee. And he shared with us uh, his his beliefs. And then we were also given legal counsel by Mr. Burroquez and clearly by committee vote, again, unanimous with no dissent. Any provision like this would be inappropriate for inclusion in a home rule charter. Uh, not to mention that council should be able to make those decisions with guidance or professional experts and input from the citizens, not being dictated by the citizens, uh, because that's your purview as a under your legislative authority. Section 33 had to do with rules uh, assigning an equal number of members from each district to city boards, commissions, and committees, unless dictated by state law. Uh, in that regard, uh, one of the things that Tim, Tim looked at is, is he asked staff to say, okay, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good goal to have. Uh, can you provide us some statistics for what things are right now? And uh, believe it or not, right now, uh, the statistics, all our stats show, there's not a meaningful disparity of representation among the council districts for uh, any of the assignments to the boards, commissions, or committees. Uh, it's a worthy goal, uh, but it's impractical, and it imposes operational impediments, uh, not to mention that uh, there is no disparity of representation right now. One of the things it would do is it would restrict or preclude, in a lot of cases, our pools of volunteers. You know, we, it, it's great for us to get volunteers from every district. We check with the city. They, they advertise all the districts, all the openings, all the applications are reviewed. Uh, and right now the statistics show there's no meaningful disparity. It's a worthy goal. Again, it's inappropriate for inclusion in a home rule charter. Uh, and not to mention the fact that if you reduce that pool, and let's just say that there's a board that's short a representative of a particular district and you, you, you need a quorum, you're going to need somebody to make that border commission appointment, you may not have that pool of people that you could actually make the board happen or the commission. Again, so it was not supported by the uh, Charter Review Advisory Committee. Uh, the next section uh, actually is the uh, same same reasoning about no person shall be appointed to no more than two of the following city boards, committees, or commissions, or special committees. Uh, we address that in the, the suggestions that we have for uh, in the, the charter amendments. Again, what they found was if you restrict it to two or three or four, uh, it almost makes it impossible for the city to handle its elections. The elections uh, are a lot of times uh, not just... City of Bryan, but City of Bryan, City College Station, and the county. Uh, as a result, the, the polling uh, places have volunteers, and they're in need of bilingual speakers. Uh, but what happens is, if those people are active with other commissions or boards within a city, then they're going to drop one or, or the other, or they'd be precluded, for example, from helping with voter uh, or, or any of the other commissions they would be uh, restricted from. Uh, some people have a better, better ability to, to be on more than one board. Again, it's by appointment. Again, it's representative. And again, uh, uh, it's sensitive, I think, in each one of the precincts uh, that everybody be represented. Again, that's not proper to be included in a home rule charter, this particular change. Nine and ten took our most uh, attention. And I know you probably should use those first rather than last. Uh, but the suggested change at 9 had to do with Section 16, where the City Council conducts an annual needs analysis for low to moderate income housing and develop an action plan to address 15% each year funding available. All right, with, with research and our special counsel's input, uh, the council unanimously uh, was uh, the advisory committee uh, was not able to support this in any way, and we can give you the details. You cannot commit city resources toward funding low to moderate income housing as it's a legislative decision that cannot be delegated. Also, it puts the city of Bryan at, a, at an enormous competitive disadvantage in that 
our financial advisor uh, in regard to what would happen if we had to do an action plan that set aside specific funds out of your general fund for uh, low to moderate income housing, and a rigid funding rule adversely affects the city's bond rating, effectively uh, hiking interest rates for all future bond packages. So there's an adverse effect, a serious adverse effect on our bond rating in the event that this were to pass. The other issue with this, besides the fact that it's inappropriate, is it only asks for an action plan. It doesn't have a mechanism for funding an action plan. And it also doesn't require a plan of action to take place after you make the plan. So it's in all things inappropriate and, and not worded in a way it could be supported. And if supported, would negatively affect the city of Bryan's bond rating. Section 10, uh, the number 10, section 12, had to do with the one I think that had the most uh, interest for our group and that we got the most support on. Uh, in this case, uh, the proposition is that an additional fee to permits be issued from 5% to 10% of the value of all new construction with a maximum limit of 10% for new commercial construction and 5% for new single family home construction. All right, working through all that math, uh, I'll get to that in a second. The more important thing about that is it is, it, 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 council has advised it's already void ad minutio. Uh, the proposition regarding linkage fees, such as those created by this proposition, are been expressly prohibited by recent legislation being House Bill 1449, which is now codified in the Texas Local Government Code at uh, Section 250.008. So this particular proposal is already void at its inception. But it's, it would go further. This particular provision also is an unlawful grant of public funds in violation of the Texas Constitution, Article 3, Section 52. Additionally, the policy decision for funding low to moderate income housing is a legislative decision that can't be delegated to, in this case, the, the voters. But in the event that it was not illegal, which it already is, we also asked the city's financial officer to advise us what would be the financial impact in the event this was passed and was legal. This fee would impose approximately $9 million annually on builders and have the effect of increasing the average cost of a new single-family home by $5,000, which would already be intended for low to moderate income housing market, not to mention provide us with a competitive disadvantage to any other town similarly situated or near to us in this entire area. The idea here of... of Assisting low to moderate income housing, we, we've been assured the city works on this through the city manager's office, through PNZ, through the council, through your ordinance and resolution. It would be wholly improper to do it here, not to mention the fact that it's just flat illegal. Uh, but the other thing is, and there was a stat, and I'm not going to be able to, uh, to uh, address it right now because I can't remember it. But uh, I heard it at the Bryan Business Council. Kenny, you might could remember. But for every $5,000 that is, is tagged on to the cost of a, of a home, be it from taxes, fees, or otherwise, you lose 20,000 applicants that are available for uh, applying for that loan. And I think that's the number. Is that right? And so, and so what happens is the net effect of this would be not only negative for the city and give us a competitive disadvantage, it can't meet what's the idea here is to help low to moderate income housing. It, it has the opposite effect, uh, according to the chief financial officer and the stats that we got through the Bryan Business Council. So in that, so for us, this is our task. Our task was to do this in a neutral manner, by people that were assigned uh, to us uh, and and participated uh, through open discussion and caucus, uh, all in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Uh, we had people that were there for uh, 
watching the uh, our discussions, the minutes are before you, our conclusions are before you. Uh, simply stated, we have 13 items that we think as a Charter Review Advisory Committee that the City Council, in our opinion, should support and go forth to the voters and ask that that be approved. In regard to all the items that are presented by petition, uh, it's the committee's decision by unanimous vote with no dissent that the City Council not support any of those propositions for the reasons that we've stated uh, when it's presented to the voters. And again, for, for a few of those that are already illegal or invalid on their face. So that was our conclusions, and, and I'll be happy to, we, Mr. Burke has us here, and he can answer any questions. But I do want to bring to the council the same questions that was asked uh, when we concluded, and I think Kenny, Kenny led the discussion, and it came up with the planning and zoning, it came up with the Bryant Business Council, and it m might be in, in your minds. Uh, one of the things that we thought from a standpoint of effort of the city staff, cost of elections, uh, whether or not the petition laws requested, required, uh, before they got presented for any reason, that they be reviewed by city attorneys, council, uh, or that there be some manner to determine whether or not they were legal, valid, appropriate, uh, before being presented to the, uh, the voters. It seemed like that would make common sense to a degree. Uh, but the petition laws of the state of Texas do not require that. So that in the event that something were to get passed, it was illegal on its face or from uh, its inception. Uh, Mr. Boraquez assured us that the state law is you deal with it then. If it's not valid, it's not valid. It just gets stuck in your charter and you have to clean it up later. Uh, but I think from the, the our advisory committee standpoint, uh, it just seemed like some common sense, some practicalities before we present things to the voters uh, might give consideration for the strain, the burden, the costs of uh, presenting those to a, a, a public or a populace if they're, they're not going to be valid when they get voted on anyway, because I think that's it, it's it's not the the message that you want to give the voters, I don't think. And I don't think that it's it's something that that couldn't be addressed. But what we found out was uh, for any proponent of, of, of petitions, it's it, it, that's their that's their petition. State law makes it wide open and you can propose whatever you want to. If you if you get enough uh, signatures, you can get it to a vote. Uh, it's just not going to be valid in all cases. Uh, we were just hoping there might be a way to kind of uh, make these read a little better before they got presented to the uh, public. But that's up to the proponent of any petition. And so Mr. Burquez was very, very helpful in that regard because uh, I think as a, as a group we're thinking, wow, we could fix all this at one time. And the reality is uh, petition laws are petition laws, and that's just what we deal with. So uh, I hope to a man, it was a, a, a great experience for me. Uh, I appreciate being uh, asked to be part of this. Uh, I appreciate Tim asking me to, <clears throat> to talk. I have a hard time doing that sometimes. And, uh, but for all our committee members, uh, it was a pleasure to serve with them. Uh, they were open. They were honest. Uh, we were neutral. Uh, and uh, for us to come together like this to make this presentation took a lot of work on the staff, uh, Janice and her team, uh, Mary Lynn, uh, Alan Burraquez, and then everyone here that had to take time from their day jobs uh, and do this. But it was our pleasure to do it for the city, uh, for the citizens, uh, and, and that's our suggested advice to the council.